Um, so with view to the title of the event, um, um, I will begin with China's uh, security policy and foreign policy, uh, but I will also briefly say one or two words on um, China's domestic situation because it does has an influence. Um, so as much uh, as we have been seeing so far, China seems to be pushing um, limits and trying to set new borders um, very, very slightly and very, very slowly. Um, China's foreign policy has shifted from creating a peaceful surrounding to a more active and maybe you can say also more risk-friendly foreign policy and security policy. So in the last years, uh, as probably you will all know and you have seen, tensions increased with uh, Japan over the Senkaku or Diaoyu uh, Islands uh, in the East China Sea, um, with the Philippines uh, over Scarborough Shoal and in the, South, in the South China Sea, and recently a Chinese state-owned uh, oil company moved an oil rig to a site uh, in the South China Sea between Vietnam and the Parcel Islands. Um, and this is where also Chinese and Vietnamese ships clashed. Uh, in February, for example, we also saw a Chinese naval drill come, came, that came as close to Australia as never before. Um, last October, Chinese ships uh, con converged in the Western Pacific to show they can breach the so-called first island chain. Um, so as I said, we see movements, we see um, testing limits, uh, probably even moving limits, moving borders, uh, more activities, probably more risk-friendly. And today you could maybe almost say that China mirrors a little bit Russia, uh, Russia's role in, in Europe. Um, not to that extent, but in some ways, both are changing the landscape um, in their regional spheres. Um, so this changing landscape um, we see in Asia, especially in terms of defense and, and military buildup. China's military budget is expected to be as much as 200 uh, billion US dollars this year which is far away from the U.S. Uh, defense uh, military budget. Uh, last year that was uh, around $700 billion. But the U.S. is cutting um, spending while China is increasing. So the mili military budget grew around 10% each year. Now it was even announced to grow 12.2%. Uh, um, this is in many ways a very natural step uh, for a growing country, for a developing country, and for a country that is trying to develop a blue water navy. Um, but it reflects the growing power rivalry in Asia. India's defense spending is rising as well. Um, so is uh, the one of, of South Korea. And even Japan is redefining at least its defense stance. Um, India moved to take ties with South Korea and Japan to a new height um, in 2013. In North Korea, we, we, we don't know really. I mean, we keep on guessing the next moves of Kim Jong-un, um, but he seems to be unpredictable and therefore probably also more dangerous. Um, looking away from East uh, Asia and just to look to South Asia, we still have nuclear powers such as India and Pakistan facing each other. So this is not a really changing landscape, but it adds to the risks and, uh, and tensions uh, in, the, in Asia as a whole. Um, meanwhile, um, we are all asking if the US are decreasing engagement worldwide, um, so also, also in Asia. Um, so as much as we can see so far, no actor wants a war, except it can't be prevented probably. Um, I think even for North Korea we can say this, but coincidences and accidents can happen. Um, I don't think that any actor in Asia is striving uh, for war or planning uh, a war. Also China does not strive for war. 
but it could take the chance if it seems necessary. There are a few scenarios um, I think we could all imagine how um, military conflict could escalate or be triggered, as mentioned, uh, with view to Senkaku Daui Island, with view to North Korea, uh, uh, and, and Kim Jong-un and his next steps. Or um, there could be a scenario where China declares a new air defense zone um, for the South China Sea. This would be a direct challenge to Europe also. Um, so what about Europe? What do we think and what do we say and do we think anything? Um, I think the first step for Europeans would be to actually gain more understanding and knowledge of the region. And I mean not only China or those who are important to us, but I mean Asia as a whole, which is a huge challenge, of course, but it would be the first step in order to be able to debate crisis prevention, conflict prevention, etc. Um, <coughs> yes, we should ask ourselves um, what we, how we respond in case of a crisis in Asia. Um, I think uh, from a crisis in Asia the Europe would suffer, especially of course our trade and economy. Um, and even if Europe can uh, rely on the US and uh, as a security guarantor, it still might not prevent conflicts. Um, so we should deal with this. Um, so a crisis in Asia or in East Asia doesn't seem to be China's dream either. Um, not yet at least. China's dream is economy, economic stability. Stability for the country, prosperity, etc. <coughs> and then it's, uh, to quote, she regaining China's status in the world. And that also sounds better than it might be. And probably it just <laughs> sounds good to the Chinese nationals. So from that we can see that domestic interests are very strong. And actually they are probably the strongest um, in all of this. And stronger than foreign policy or security policy. Um, so the, for many things that have been said by Xi Jinping in regard to foreign and security policy actually is worth said because he wanted to prove that he's fighting for China and he wanted not to prove it to the US or to the Germans but uh, to his own people. Um, so domestic challenges are crucial right now in China as well. We see a probably declining economy. We are thinking, we are already starting to think about is there going to be an economy and financial crisis in China? What does it mean then for us, for Europe? Um, but what does it mean for China, first of all? Um, how can China maintain stability and growth? And how can the Chinese leadership keep Chinese people happy? To put it very simple. Um, just think of hundred millions of migrant workers becoming unemployed. Or think about a Tiananmen scenario in Xinjiang. Um, therefore, Xi Jinping from the beginning has been accumulating power like no other leader after Mao Zedong. And he has gained also more control um, than any other leader uh, after Mao Zedong. Um, so Beijing sees the need to strengthen the party's position domestically, but I think you can say the more unstable the domestic situation appears, the more Beijing will try to show strength to the outside, strengthen nationalism, for example, um, uh, disattract probably from problems, domestic problems. Um, race, nationalism, and so on and so forth. So, therefore, I think the title is right. Somehow China's dream could be then Asia's nightmare because the, the more he sees the need to domestically uh, strengthen the country, the more he might provoke or be active in the out, on the outside. So, actually, this is also something that relies to us gaining knowledge and understanding, which is to monitor China and also to talk to China about domestic challenges. I mean, there are things that, you know, we, we, we experienced before and we have survived and 
you know, maybe maybe a small financial economic crisis in China might not be as bad actually as as we think. Um, so this is something I think we could or we should also discuss with China itself and our China Chinese counterparts. So um, the final thoughts on Europe in Asia: um, we must talk to China. We must talk to China's neighbors, especially the, the, the ones that are closest to us, to us which are the democracies, um, so India and Japan, for example. We have frameworks and we have instruments. Um, we have soft instruments, we have corporations. Um, we, we have to talk always to the US, of course, but we also should separately talk about <coughs> this without the US. And uh, there have been suggestions which I also um, encourage about a European Asia partnership, for example. I mean, we should think more beyond out of the box. On security, um, Europe has no hard power instrument. This we know, this we always emphasize. We have only soft power, we have no hard power. But we play a role. And this role we should also consider, which is our own arms sale. I'm a German, I know how much arms we sell and I don't like it. <laughs> um, so also this is something uh, we should rethink and reframe maybe. So all in all, actually, what um, the conclusion is, is that Europe needs a new framework in Asia, a true Asia policy, a true Asia strategy. Um, surely Europe makes efforts to pursue a joint policy in Asia. Uh, but these efforts mainly concern the major trading partners in Asia, China, and to a lesser degree, traditional partners such as uh, Japan or the ASEAN countries. The EU has already recognized these deficits and therefore it also tries to deepen the strategic partnership with India, for example, um, and has concluded uh, free trade agreements with South Korea and uh, Southeast Asian countries. Um, and also the EU, EU is right now in the process of negotiating an FTA with Japan, even. At the same time, there are bilateral ties between uh, European countries and Asian countries, which often compete with EU efforts, especially in the case of member states that have traditional strong ties to various partners in Asia. Again, I talk as a German, I know. <laughs> um, at the same time, considering um, all these uh, volatile problems that I've mentioned before uh, and we find in the region, I think no one would disagree that a more cohere coherent strategy um, or more coherent uh, European strategy in Asia would be uh, an advantage for Europe. So thank you. That's it. Okay.